Welcome here to the School Lunch and Learn at the University of Toronto Faculty Club, the new home of School Lunch and Learn. We used to meet elsewhere uptown, but this is our new downtown location. It has proved to be very popular. We've attracted a number of new attendees, new to School Lunch and Learn, a younger clientele, if I may refer to them as clientele, uh, as such. Uh, we, for those of you watching online, we've just had a wonderful lunch here at the Faculty Club, and now we're about to begin with the more formal part of the presentation. So again, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. The subject is Waste to Value. What an intriguing title. Uh, Professor Mansur Barati is the Gerald R. Hefferman Chair and a professor in sustainable materials processing, obviously here at the University of Toronto. His research is centered on reducing the environmental footprint and lowering the consumption of energy and resources in the metals industry, as well as the development of high quality materials for renewable energy systems. That's obviously a subject that's of growing interest. He joined the University of Toronto after one year at Worley Parsons and established the Sustainable Materials Processing Research Lab where 80 researchers have worked in the past 10 years. His research has been highlighted in about 200 publications, if you can believe it, and has been recognized by many awards, too many uh, to, to, to mention, so at this point, I would ask you to please join me in welcoming Professor Mansur Barai. Thank you very much, Laurie, for the introduction. Can people hear me, I guess? I hope I'm not too loud. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and as I mentioned to Laurie earlier, to speak to a larger audience than our uh, typical uh, people in the field, uh, which becomes very technical. So people uh, usually get a laugh when I say my second love, love after uh, my family is waste. Uh, but uh, that, that's true. Uh, I have a personal uh, attachment to the environment. Uh, outdoor is my thing, so uh, I really am passionate about uh, cleaning up the environment when it's possible. And uh, professionally, it has led me to this point as well. In fact, uh, my training is in a steel making, uh, which is somewhat related to what I'm going to talk about. But uh, after one year working at Worley Parsons and uh, working on a couple of projects related to recycling, that kind of shifted my interest uh, towards this topic that you see. And hopefully that will be evident uh, through my talk as well. So uh, talking about waste, uh, uh, Basically, I look at it, the waste processing and converting it to valuable products. I look at it from two angles. One is uh, obviously cleaning up the environment. Taking care of any waste uh, would be helpful in that regard. But the other uh, aspect of it is uh, supplying or converting these waste into resources uh, which otherwise would have been harvested from the earth or, or atmosphere. So to uh, Because resource supply is a huge issue. And uh, a very nice way to show, at, show that is uh, this website called Earth Overshoot Day. You can go and check it out. Uh, it basically uh, does some calculation and gives you a date in a, each year by which uh, the Earth runs out of its capacity to supply the resources that we consume sustainably. That obviously applies to renewable resources when it comes to resources such as metals and minerals, uh, they are non-renewable to begin with. So what this shows is, uh, let's say in the 70s, early 70s, the Earth was in a more or less sustainable situation. Uh, and uh, as the years went by, uh, just taking last year, uh, by the July 29th, uh, we were basically already running into debt. In other words, whatever we consumed after that point was borrowing from the future generations. Uh, or you could say the other way to look at it is uh, we need basically two Earths to supply the resources that we need, obviously because of increasing population and a population which is also more and more consuming. So what are our solutions around this uh, 
hunger for resources. Um, one is uh, to look at non-traditional places. Uh, you've seen maybe Avatar. Uh, they look in uh, outer space for uh, minerals, and uh, it was sci-fi just a couple of years ago, but now they are kind of seriously considering it. And if you go to these mining conferences, there are talks, and they do economic assessment and all of those to, to, to look at it as a potential future way to, to obtain these uh, materials we need. Or uh, deep sea mining is now a reality, basically. We just uh, dig things out of the ocean floor and process them to get uh, more minerals and metals. Uh, however, uh, as you could imagine, the cost of associated with these uh, non-traditional resources could be quite significant, and uh, the, the impact on the economy and even supply could be, could be quite uh, massive. There is, however, a closer uh, place to look at for supply of resources, and that is recycling. Basically, anything that we recycle is uh, we are saving down the street or somewhere, uh, uh, some digging out of the ground or growing gap. And that's uh, what I'm going to mostly talk about. It's closer to home. It's probably the easiest way to, to get resources. And if you do it effectively, you basically, in effect, convert uh, a non-renewable resource, a material, into a renewable resource, which keeps uh, being updated every time. Uh, for example, the Cleopatra's gold, people say it's a still in circulation because it's a valuable material and was being uh, recycled. So, talking about recycling, there are two totally different streams uh, when, when we consider uh, them as a resource. Uh, one is the domestic waste. We are all familiar with, uh, with it. There are a lot of uh, good things happening, uh, a lot of uh, education uh, going on, uh, technologies are advancing, although technology is not the biggest issue there, but uh, that you are familiar with. However, another stream of waste materials, which are less familiar to the public's eye, is the industrial waste. And uh, in this picture down here, you see a lot of houses, and farther away, you see these two big mountains. These are artificial mountains made from a slag, which is a waste material uh, in metals extraction. And uh, this is from one smelter only, but you consider there are thousands of these smelters around the world and each one would have uh, some, something like this, or most of them at least. So, uh, again, uh, my focus here is that, uh, and today is about the industrial waste, for several reasons, uh, I, I think processing of these, in some respect, could be easier than the domestic waste. One reason is that they are highly concentrated in one place. They are not polluted and uh, mixed with other stuff. And also, they are closer to the processing facilities uh, where, where the uh, technology is, and uh, therefore the cost could be uh, much less. And also, these are the materials which have already been dug out of the ground, have been crushed ground, so a lot of cost which, involve, which uh, is there in materials processing has already been uh, taken place for these. So uh, you could probably treat them at lower cost for, in many cases. So today, uh, today I'll... Uh, give you three examples of uh, waste processing related to my research. Uh, hopefully to kind of demonstrate the value of these uh, and the potential of these. Uh, first one is uh, valorization of pyrotite tailings. Does anybody know here what pyrotite is? Chris. <laughs> so pyrotite is a waste material. Uh, basically it's a mineral. Uh, which is produced uh, often when we treat sulfide ores, such as nickel and copper ores, in order to produce those metals. And uh, a large portion of the ore is basically this material, pyrotite. So what they do with it is they dump it into tailing ponds and then cover it with a layer of water in order to protect it from the atmosphere, because otherwise it gets oxidized, produces sulfuric acid, causes acid mine drainage, and leaches out the metals. And, uh, this aerial image of Sudbury shows some of that effect. Uh, so anything here that you see here, which is red, brown, or yellowish, shows acid mine drainage, and basically conversion of this material into acid, which eventually leaches out the iron, hence the redness of these streams. Right? So they do a pretty good job in maintaining this. That's why you don't see much of it. But anyway, if you look at the scale, these are massive, uh, massive tailing ponds, all loaded with this material. So a simple diagram of nickel extraction as one example in the Sudbury, they begin with a nickel ore which has up to 3% nickel. And that cannot be directly smelted because of the cost. Uh, 
So they basically upgraded to a material which is about 15, 20% nickel. And I want you to remember this diagram, that's three simple streams. That, and then on the side, a large percentage of the ore, 70, 80%, sometimes more, becomes pure titanics, which has less than 1% nickel, basically. And this material uh, is mostly basically an iron sulfide. It has a bit of nickel, up to 1%. Uh, and our estimates show that uh, there is about 100 million tons of this material sitting in the tailing ponds uh, in South Bay area. And also each day they could produce up to 5,000 tons of uh, just fresh tailings coming every day. There is no use for it for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, there is no local market for sulfur or iron products. So, this material, like I said, is mostly iron sulfide, but there is no, they can't sell it. And if they were to ship it to destinations where there is market for it, such as Asia, there is a technical limitation. That is, this material is pyrophoric, which means that if you store it basically in dry state, it might catch fire. So you can't ship it over long distances. Hence, uh, why it's sitting there. So we try to address this issue by looking at uh, some fundamentals of uh, materials processing at high temperature. I hopefully won't bore you with this diagram, uh, but us metallurgists, we have to show this that, uh, to at least demonstrate that there is some science behind it. But uh, basically what this diagram shows, we call it a ternary diagram of sulfur, iron, and nickel. And it shows a map of the components which could form or compounds once you put these three elements together at different proportions. And this diagram is plotted for 800 degrees centigrade. This tailing material, which I talked about, lies in this area, pyrotite. In fact, if I zoom around this corner, uh, it's around this point in terms of composition. And as you can see, it's a single phase. It's just one mineral. But if we change the composition towards this corner, by playing with the chemistry, we basically fall into this two-phase region where you produce an alloy and a sulfide. And this alloy would happen to be ferronickel, iron nickel, which is highly demanded in making a stainless steel, right? What they make here is spoon and uh, forks with. So with this idea, we decided to approach this, basically change the composition of pyrotite, produce an alloy and a sulfide. And we've been doing this for the past uh, five years, a lot of tests in order to optimize and test this process. But uh, here you can see an image of one of our products uh, after some treatment. And the shiny bright phase here is the alloy phase. And the grayish phase is the sulfide. Right? So after some treatment, we can separate out the nickel and iron as a ferronickel phase. And this diagram down here is shows basically microanalysis of this, which shows if you cross from the sulfide into the alloy, the nickel concentration goes up. So you have a ferroalloy, basically. So what do we get with this? We get basically two products, uh, this ferro-nickel alloy, which is a high value product. And at the same time, we realize that something else also happens at the same time. And that is the sulfide that we have now, although it's iron sulfide, but just a bit of change in its chemistry makes it non-pyrophoric. So now it opens a lot of opportunity in terms of shipping it. We could ship it over distances uh, and uh, use this material where there is actually a market for it. So with this uh, in mind, we developed uh, this kind of process flow diagram, which says basically if we begin with one ton of pyrotite, put it through our process, uh, we get two products. One is this iron sulfide. The other one is this ferroalloy. And based on our optimized conditions, uh, you get these kind of numbers in terms of tonnage. Yeah. So this sulfide can be further roasted once shipped uh, and uh, processed, roasted to produce uh, three products, iron oxide, sulfur dioxide, and steam. And surprisingly, how the mass balance works, uh, from one ton of pyrotite, you produce just less than one ton of iron oxide, one ton of sulfuric acid, 200 kilowatt hours of electricity, and 300 kilos of this ferroalloy at 4% nickel. So putting some value, dollar values on these, uh, this could sell, the value of these, all of these together is over $350 per ton, which is quite substantial considering for a lot of the ores that we dig out of the ground, their value is between $40 to $100. And this waste material could worth uh, over $300 per ton. 
We don't know yet how much it would actually cost to process it, and that's the, our next step of the study, but uh, there is a lot of promise there. And with this, basically, if we realize this, we go from a waste stream to valuable products. All of it, basically, zero uh, leftover. So that was uh, the idea that we started this research with. But along the way, we also came up with another uh, interesting idea, and that was if we can extract nickel out of this waste material, why don't do it on the concentrate itself? Remember this diagram? We have nickel ore, we produce a concentrate with 15, 20%. Nowadays, the way they process this material and extract nickel out of it is uh, they put it through a smelting, which means basically they blast it with oxygen, everything is liquefied, all the sulfur becomes sulfur dioxide, which is captured or in some places emitted. And then after some refining, you get nickel. So in other words, on this diagram, that's where the, our original material is. And they move towards this corner. They basically they remove sulfur and iron to produce pure nickel. But we know most of this nickel, over 60%, ends up in a steel making uh, as a ferro-nickel, iron-nickel alloy. So the idea was we don't really have, need pure nickel. We could just produce a ferro-nickel, which would serve the same purpose. And with that, uh, we basically said, what if we move on this direction? Right? By adding only iron to this uh, material, we could move over here, produce uh, ferro-nickel and a sulfide. What is the advantage? The advantage is uh, all the sulfur in this process remains in the solid state. There is no sulfur emission, which would be a huge benefit for these industries because uh, some smelters for in Canada for, are being shut down because of their sulfur emission. So if you could address this, that opens a lot of uh, opportunities for them. Right? Again, we tested this in the laboratory scale, and here this image shows the aftermath of processing. All these bright phases, they, they are ferro-nickel particles. And their concentration of nickel is well above what they need in steel making, uh, so that would be a good product for them and the remaining is sulfur. So in principle, it works. In fact, the results are very good because we realized within only 10 minutes of processing, we could recover nearly 90% of nickel. And if we extend it to only half an hour, we could uh, get over 90% of nickel out, uh, which is even more than the current technologies, uh, current best technologies. So there is some promise there, uh, and, and we are uh, continuing this research uh, on both fronts, both the waste and the, and the concentrate. So the second topic I chose for today is related to recovery of energy, not, uh, not materials from a waste, another waste stream, uh, traditional waste stream, and that is uh, metallurgical slags. So who knows what the slags are, other than Chris? <laughs> so, so slags are another byproduct of uh, uh, metallurgical operations. Uh, basically, once we extract and refine metals, there is this kind of molten dirt layer, which is kind of like molten lava, sitting on top of the metal. So they just uh, skim it off, and uh, a lot of times that's what happens to it. They take a pot of it, they dump it into an area called uh, a slag pit. It gets cold, uh, cool there, and uh, sits there sometimes forever. Sometimes it's excavated and used as aggregate and uh, construction materials. And as you can see, pretty much, like, it's a molten material at 1300, 1600 degrees centigrade. All of that heat is wasted. This material is produced at 800 million tons per year. So for each person, on average in the globe, we produce over 100 kilo of a slag. Massive amount of material all of that molten, all at very high temperatures. So a vast amount of energy is wasted there. Uh, in fact, our estimates show this is equivalent to about 40 million tons of coal, or 200 uh, million barrels of oil. Or in electricity terms, uh, over 300 terawatts hours of ener energy. That's what it's wasted there. Try to put some dollar values on it. Uh, the materials value of this product, the slag is uh, over $2 billion, uh, the environmental and energy value of this is uh, nearly $10 billion each year. So again, uh, quite attractive figures uh, for a waste stream. In fact, uh, again, our estimates show that uh, 
If we could realize the full potential, full environmental value of this material, it's equivalent to removing over 200 million cars off the roads in terms of CO2 footprint. So it would be a massive impact in terms of uh, environmental protection. So with the local company, Hatch, uh, Chris is here, so he's aware of this, uh, this project that we did for some time. Uh, we've been trying to kind of address this issue by recovering the waste heat from, uh, from these molten slags. In current technologies, as you saw, a lot of them, they just basically don't do anything, just let cool in the environment. Uh, uh, and in some of them, they dump it into water. In both cases, the heat is lost. Here in this technology, we, uh, the idea is uh, we do it in dry state using air, and therefore uh, we could recover the heat. So the idea is pretty simple. We take this molten slag, dump it onto a launder, which falls into like a molten sheet of uh, liquid, and then we blast it with the highest speed jet of air. And it breaks it into these uh, flying particles, uh, which on the flight they get solidified, become these little granules uh, in a millimeter range. And uh, the heat is transferred to air, so you could basically take the hot air and uh, use its heat for a steam generation, power generation, or a space heating, and so on. And at the same time, you convert this slag into these fine powders, which are easier to transport. Sometimes they are even directly used as uh, sandblast, like abrasive materials, and so on. So there is benefits on both the materials and energy values. A very short video of how it's done in industrial scale. But yeah, you can see pretty simple. The slag is dumped and converted into these uh, products. So, so the value of these uh, slag products depends on, uh, to a large extent, depends on their chemistry and also how they are cooled. For example, uh, the blast furnace slags, if they're cooled very rapidly, so you form kind of an amorphous glass phase, um, you, pr you produce a material which is suitable for cement making. And you could sell that for uh, over $100 per ton. If it's cooled under controlled conditions, which means cooled rapidly first, and then maintained at a certain temperature for a certain period of time, you'd produce what is called glass ceramic, which is basically the same material as your uh, kitchen countertop. And you could sell it for over uh, $500 per ton. Or if it just let cool it slowly, you could make aggregate out of it and sell it for $5 to $10 per ton. So you could say the cooling uh, profile affects the product quality and value. Right? And one big question was how fast do we need to cool it to, uh, to get these products. So in one research that we've been doing here, we may try to understand how this material crystallizes at these high temperatures and how it basically responds to the different cooling conditions. So what you see here is a tip of a thermocouple at high temperature, in this case, 1380 degrees centigrade. So this is actually a few millimeter across. And what you see in the middle, this, uh, which is a dark area, this is an opaque, uh, sorry, a transparent, basically glass-like material. And if you hold it at this temperature for just uh, uh, tens of seconds, you start seeing these little patches, which I hope they're seen from there, which are basically crystalline phases. And over time, they grow, more of them appear, and at some point, uh, it covers the whole area, which means it's fully crystalline now. By just changing the temperature a little bit, going from 1380 to uh, 1300, the behavior changes totally. Like, uh, Instead of many small patches, now we have only three large crystals which grow in different directions and eventually make it uh, fully crystalline. So very cool things that you could nowadays observe at high temperature, basically looking at things, uh, seeing what's happening in those conditions and understand the processes better. Or different composition, different behavior and so on. And what we get out of this is we basically then uh, process these images and uh, plot a uh, crystallized fraction of a slag as a function of time for different temperatures. And we get things like this. So if you were to produce a material which is now, let's say, 50% uh, glassy, you could go to this chart and decide when you have to stop that process or quench your sample, basically. 
or produce a more sophisticated diagram called TTT diagram, which basically tells you how fast you need to cool these slags if you want it to get fully glassy content, which is suitable for cement making. And obviously at university we try to get as smart and just go beyond experiments, basically make our work more predictable. And that's what my student did after digging a lot into literature and putting her own thought into this. So uh, what you see here is basically a critical cooling rate or how fast you need to cool the stuff uh, calculated against measured. So she has this correlation which now allows us to basically calculate rather than do, having to do all these measurements uh, how fast we need to cool different slags in order to get fully crystalline or amorphous phases. So in this case, you could see the range goes from few degrees per second to 50 degrees per second uh, is, is what we need. Uh. In another part of this work, uh, we were interested to know uh, when we do this atomization or granulation process, what are the uh, product characteristics? Because again, that affects the utility or the usability of these uh, products. For example, some application for a slag involves uh, uh, converting them into these uh, filament-like uh, materials, which are used as uh, insulating materials called a slag wool. Right? So you want elongated, long uh, particles. In some other applications, for example, in sandblasting, you want round, uh, small particles. And it was important to know what affects this, how can we control this. So what you see here is some of our modeling work uh, using low temperature fluids and fluids of different properties, viscosity and such, uh, and show how they behave com for this atomization process. Like uh, here you can see atomization happens right away. We produce almost fully spherical particles. But here you see all these stringers. Uh, and again, we try to be more predictable. So here what you see is uh, we can actually calculate the size of these particles. Uh, against uh, operating parameters such as gas uh, ratio and so on. So again, another example of how fundamental research at university could help us uh, produce custom products of, out of waste stream. Uh, the third and uh, last story uh, is about uh, another uh, material called red mud. Anyone knowing red mud or have heard about red mud? I'm glad Chris is here. <laughs> That's good. So uh, you, I, I was, yeah, I, even my, my students in my class, sometimes they haven't heard about it. But uh, you might have heard about an incident in Hungary in 2010, October 4th, uh, when uh, a tailing dam broke and just the flood itself killed uh, a dozen people, uh, nine people, I think, at the time. So red mud is a waste a stream uh, produced in extraction of aluminum. For every ton of aluminum that we have, we produce, about two to four, four tons of this waste stream is generated. So each year, over 150 million tons of this material is produced. Less than 3% is consumed. And over the years, uh, over 3 billion tons of this material is, has been produced. And what they do with it is basically they make, make these uh, massive diked areas near the aluminum plants uh, and just uh, store it there because it's highly alkaline. There isn't much use for it at this time. And uh, from time to time, things like this happen. In this case, the dam broke up. And just to get a sense of the scale, you'd see these bulldozers here, right? So the, down here. So these are massive uh, uh, tailing areas, basically. And here's the aftermath of that incident uh, in uh, Hungary. The whole city was flooded with this uh, red alkaline material, so the efforts took months uh, to clean up a lot of uh, costs involved, and as I said, uh, lives were lost as well. So there are a lot of uh, efforts, especially in Europe, going on uh, in order to find a use for this material because it's a huge environmental uh, liability for the aluminum uh, producers. My background being a steel making, I looked at uh, uh, th that field. So a bit, of, uh, a bit about the steel making and how it's connected to the aluminum industry in our case. Uh, in order to make a steel, basically they take iron ore, coal, put it together at high temperature and they produce a material called hot metal. 
which is basically a liquid iron with a lot of impurities, carbon, silicon, sulfur, and phosphorus. But the steel that we use typically has a lot more of, less of these impurities. Has less than 2.2% carbon, much less silicon, sulfur, and phosphorus. So somewhere along the way, these impurities have to be removed. And typically it's done in a vessel which you call torpedo car. Uh, so we put some fluxes, molten oxides onto the, uh, onto the hot metal, and it picks up these impurities. So this is the typical like, commercial flux they use uh, in terms of composition. So it has about 35% alumina, 55% calcium oxide, and some other trace uh, components. And here in the middle column, you see the composition of the red mud uh, that they produce in the aluminum industry. And I've highlighted these two comp uh, components of interest, uh, alumina and lime. So in the red mud, we have between 15 to 25% of uh, alumina and up to 20% lime. And the ratio is not bad, although we have a lot more other impurities such as iron oxide. However, it happens that iron oxide is not actually a bad thing if we were to produce a flux out of this material because remember here we are actually putting this flux onto a liquid iron bath. So iron is not a contaminant, it's a good thing in fact. And even the oxygen which is involved with iron oxide, it helps remove these impurities. So, uh, so iron oxide is actually a good thing. We have alumina, we have lime, and the other components we can kind of neutralize or mitigate their effect by adjusting the composition. And that's where basically the idea came from. In order to take this uh, waste material from the aluminum industry and make a flux for the steel industry and kind of marry these two industries uh, together, address the environmental issue of the aluminum industry, and produce a low-cost flux for the, for the steel refining. So we had to again test the idea, and uh, that's what we did in the lab. Uh, simply we produce uh, a bath of liquid iron with impurities, make our flux, put it on top of the uh, liquid metal, and then check the composition, basically take samples and measure their composition over time, and see whether anything happens to the impurities. So here what you see is a sharp drop in the composition concentration of sulfur, which is a major impurity concern. Within 10, 20 minutes, uh, we basically fall below the levels that we want using our flux. And it's not just our flux, flux with the adjusted chemistry. Uh, same thing here, uh, and even in this case, uh, last graph, you see removing of a several impurities at the same time using this uh, customized flux. So in practice, basically, it showed it's a very effective flux. Uh, we had to look at many other aspects, uh, environmental aspect, uh, the corrosiveness of it, uh, the cost, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm gonna skip that just uh, the interest of time and look at uh, potential industrial implementation. So what if, basically, the steel industry supplied all its fluxes from uh, this material that we are proposing. So if you were to refine one ton of steel, we would need, uh, based on our calculations, 20 kilos of this red mud, 11 kilos of lime, some oxygen, and with that uh, we would produce uh, a refined metal which has the composition that we want. And uh, about 30 kilo of uh, molten x slag. And along the way, so we achieve the refining, and also we gain about 0.7% iron. Remember I earlier mentioned iron is a good thing here? That's where its effect becomes evident. So with only 20 kilos of this material, we gain 0.7%, which doesn't seem a lot, but considering that over 1 billion tons of iron is produced by this method, multiplied by 0.7, that's quite substantial. And the, more, the other interesting part was this is slag which is produced here. It has the right composition to be used as in cement making. So we are basically taking this material from the aluminum industry, we recover all of its iron, and the remaining is also a material which is good for cement industry. So if, if all the steel refining or iron refining, sorry, was done by this, uh, in each year we could produce, consume up to 20 million tons of this red mud. 
we could produce an additional 7 million tons of uh, iron, which is about half of all we are still produced in Canada, more than half in fact. Um, also, it helps the downstream processing. It reduces the need for desulfurization, dephosphorization. In other words, it actually helps the processes downstream of this step in terms of cost and so on. And also, it produced about uh, 18 million tons of uh, cement grade uh, byproduct, which has the right composition. Obviously, these are the benefits. There are a lot of unknowns. Uh, the transportation and calcination costs are not known. Typically, aluminum smelters are far away from the steel plants. So, uh, the, and also, the effect of uh, some chemicals such as sodium, et cetera, have to be studied. And that's where the research uh, plays a role. So, I'd like to end my talk with uh, kind of the, some uh, points about the challenges. Uh, what you saw or heard are the glory points, uh, the nice things and good things about this uh, potential uh, processing of these uh, industrial waste. As you saw, they are massive. In fact, in terms of a scale, there are a lot more than the domestic waste. And the potential is significant because of the reasons I mentioned. They're highly concentrated. Um, not contaminated with other waste and so on. But there are big challenges. And one challenge is vision, I think. Uh, we still are in the phase when the mentality of looking at waste as a value is not quite there. It's emerging, but uh, people are more used to traditional sources uh, which are more accessible and they are more comfortable with. So just to change that mindset in the decision makers uh, is not that uh, straightforward. Uh, these are non-traditional materials, which means uh, for a lot of these, we have to do research, and uh, research is not a top priority for many of the businesses. Uh, because as you saw, th there has to be a lot of uh, work in university and R&D labs going into these in order to make them feasible. Uh, the economics are not certain, and the reason is obvious. We are now just starting to look at these wastes as resource. And the processes are not established. There is a lot of unknowns. And cost, the question of cost is always there when, when you talk about this. Uh, in fact, we see that already when we try to talk to industry and go to the next step to commercialize this. The first question that comes up, how much it would cost? And to be honest, we don't have answer for some of these yet. And also, the product quality is the question, because uh, again, these are different non-traditional sources. So we don't know how the products are. Uh, in terms of trace elements and composition sometimes look like. And I should say, uh, in the places where they have done successful uh, uh, utilization of base, uh, Europe and some parts of Asia, for example, it's uh, run mostly by legislation. They, they put in the legislation, and the industry has to take care of its waste. Uh, and in some places in the world, they are not exactly there. Here in North America, the legislations are actually tight in terms of emissions, but in terms of waste usage, I don't think they are there yet. We are blessed with a vast land, which means lots of uh, traditional resources, also a lot of land to hide and the, these waste materials. So, but in Japan and Europe, they don't have that luxury, so they've started looking at this a lot more seriously. So with that, uh, once hopefully these come together, uh, waste would not be waste, but rather another value stream, another materials stream, and uh, a potential for the future. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the industry partners in the three topics I talked about, uh, uh, as well as uh, people who helped in the research, a lot of uh, students and uh, faculty members. And I'd be happy to take any questions or feedback uh, from the audience. At this point, we will open the floor to questions. No, you don't have to leave the room. Questions from the floor. Don't be bashful. We are not all metallurgical engineers. Yes. Sorry, what does it? Uh, replace. Well, it would replace. Uh, I could ask you to repeat the question. Yes, I'll repeat the question for the uh, people. 
Yes, uh, so the question is uh, when we talk about using these base materials as in cement, what does it re replace? And it replaces basically natural minerals that they would uh, sand and lime uh, that they would use. Yeah. Yes, Jim. I lived for a summer in Sudbury. Um, I also had no plugs. Okay. Does it still, have they cured the sulfur dioxide problem in terms of the smell around the city? I, again, if you could replace, re repeat the question. So the question is uh, from a gentleman from Sudbury area and uh, referring to the time when you could smell uh, sulfur dioxide. The question is whether sulfur dioxide issue has been addressed. Uh, uh, my, my response is yes, as long as you, know, you grow there, the air is clean, trees are growing, and even the uh, dark, uh, well, the dark rocks are still there. So they're still dark, but uh, that is thanks to a massive investments. In fact, the cost of environmental mitigation, sulfur dioxide mitigation, is more than, sometimes more than the cost of extracting the material itself. The, the, the other aspect of Sudbury was if you went east, it was like a moonscape. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that has all been reforested now, too. Yes. Yeah. Because they used to send the NASA astronauts up there for moon landing training. Oh, okay. I didn't know that part. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Next question from the floor. While we pause, just to let you know, coffee and tea and dessert is available on the side table. One or two of you have discovered that. Feel free to stand up, wander over, grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea, whatever, and we will entertain questions from the floor. Oh, Steve Tower in the front. I have a question about the, um, the tailings pods mm -hmm. that you showed there. Mm -hmm. that, that look enormous is that typical or are they all different you know constructs and sizes uh, uh, so the, yeah the question is whether the tailing ponds that you saw the a picture of uh, they are the same as scale uh, I guess all right. the, the answer is no it uh, basically they build them to contain their waste or their tailing and depending on the uh, smelter side and the plant size uh, they are different um, but uh, they are massive. In fact, if you go to just look at the aerial images from Google Maps of um, these smelters, you could see those areas. Uh, they're pretty evident. Uh, but the, the size is different in each. Question on the left. When, uh, in one of your stories, there was something about uh, the use of slack to generate energy. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, the, the question is for the energy recovery from the slag. Would, is the infrastructure there? Uh, I'd say no, the plants today, most of them are not equipped. They don't have that equipment, obviously, otherwise they would have. Uh, but uh, in terms of technology, I, we are right at the verge of basically seeing a couple of these technologies reaching commercial stage, like the one I showed, um, which was being worked on by Hatch at some point. Uh, it has actually some installations. As far as I know, there are only two plants out of thousands which are doing this in commercial scale. Uh, the economics, uh, some figures are very attractive. There, there is, I've seen only actually one single paper about the economics of this method. That, so going back to the discussion I had later that uh, economics of these are not really not known. For that, in that paper, they show attractive figures in terms of economics of energy recovery. So it seems to be appropriate, and in terms of technology, we are almost there where we are ready to Im implement it industrial scale. Uh, there was a question at the back, and then we'll come to the left, and then we'll go to the right, the center back. We live in the global world with knowledge levels exponentially doubled in the How adaptable is this to different cultures? Because it's not the same thing in the Okay, that's a good Question. The question is, uh, these technologies, if to be implemented, uh, how adaptable they are to the local culture and I guess, uh, res uh, reception. Uh, uh, 
It's a tough question because uh, when it comes to people's perception, and it's, uh, it's the hardest thing in any effort of like this. In fact, even if you take the domestic waste, you see it's extremely hard to change people's perception just to do that simple separation. When it comes to grand scale projects like these, it's even harder because the risk involved is massive. Uh, these investments are massive, basically, to, to remediate an industrial waste. Uh, so the reception is not there, but like I said, when it's forced by legislation and they put a dollar value on the waste processing, it's no brainer. Uh, it's there, like in Europe, it's taking off massively. Japan, they've been doing it for many years, basically, where the message is zero waste, right? Uh, but it's, again, mostly driven by legislation. In terms of call acceptance by um, industry decision makers, it, it quite varies from one place to another. Next question, center just before the bar. Yes, that's you. So, sorry, I thought I, I thought I saw a hand, hand there. Hi, I have a question from online. Um, Habib is asking, are there similar studies done or being done in non-ferrous industry? Okay, so the question is, are similar things being done in the non-ferrous industry? Uh, in fact, uh, well, pretty much all the three examples I gave here, the aluminum one, the early one, the pyrotite, which is related to nickel copper, and uh, the energy recovery one is crosses between both ferrous and non-ferrous. So yes, uh, in ferrous and non-ferrous industries, uh, which relate, refers to iron and non-iron industries, uh, they do both are advancing this. There are, they have different challenges, for example, the Production rates in the steel industry are vastly different from the non-ferrous industry. Just to give the audience an like, a, but the scale, the steel is produced at 1.7 billion tons a year, whereas all the other metals combined are produced at maybe 60, 70 million tons a year. So the scale is very different, but then when it comes to individual plants, operations, the scales are comparable. So if you're comparing a non-ferrous smelter with a steel plant, it's interesting that they more or less generate the same amount of slag because they deal with different uh, ore materials. So in fact, the technology could be, I think, not in a difficult way transferred between the two disciplines. I believe there was a question to the left earlier on. If not, Question in the front, yes. The research that's being done here, mm -hmm. what's going on elsewhere in the world and is there an interchange going on in connection with it? Yes, that's a very good question. So the question is uh, the research that we do here, uh, whether it's been done in other parts of the world and how do we uh, communicate the findings? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, there is a lot of research going on uh, in the world, not as much as I think it deserves. Uh, because to be, for the longest time, the metallurgy was going down. And it was because the technologies were established. Uh, we all used technologies of 60, 70 years or longer time ago. People were comfortable until this environmental vein came about. And nowadays, it's even not the environment, it's the resource itself. So this, and like I said, in Europe, for example, the uh, European Union has invested massively in research of like. Uh, and they have two reasons. One is tackling the environmental issue. The other one, which is critical for them, is they want to basically become independent in terms of resource supply. So there is a lot going on. It has uh, initiated a lot of uh, research programs uh, in um, Northern Europe, especially. Um, and we do exchange. We, on a regular basis, we exchange students. We meet them. We hold conferences. And uh, we, we do have a lot of exchanges with them. Yes, Japanese are very, uh, like, right at the top of this as well. Not so much on the non-ferrous. They are very good in ferrous metallurgy, on uh, non-ferrous uh, to some extent as well. Um, yes, and with Japan, yeah, we, we do also exchange a lot. Although it's a more closed, I guess, uh, community than Europe. Uh, but it's still, uh, we have a lot of good interactions with them, yeah. Center at the back. So for these, this research, is there anything done from the Canadian government perspective in terms of like, 
funding initiatives for research or commercialization right now in this field? Uh, very good question. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the, uh, for example, this purified research that I talked about early on, um, well, I remember when I went uh, for a grant application uh, to, to put forward the idea and start the research, uh, my funding request was rejected, which is not unusual for a faculty member. Like some, if we get uh, the act, the, the uh, a bit background, the success rate of these was like in the 10 to 15 percent range, so I wasn't surprised, but then I thought this is a no-brainer idea. So I called them up and they said, on the committee that they decided there was, when we talk about natural resources, there was people from forestry and uh, all of those, but no one from mining. So they really actually didn't understand my project. And then the following year, they, they funded it anyway. Uh, so I would say the government hasn't been uh, proactive as in other places are like in Europe. And part of that, to be fair, I, I think it goes back to what I said, we are a very resource-rich country, uh, and we have a vast land, so <laughs> it's not the top, but uh, it's getting there, for example, in the new round of uh, uh, discussions which are going on in terms of strategic areas for Canada, I saw uh, sustainable processing of resources is one area that they are considering now as a priority. So, it wasn't like that, it's changing, hopefully. We have an online question from Sarah. We have a couple of patents. Uh, most of them are in a totally different area. Uh, uh, on this, uh, no, actually, we are, uh, it's out there. We've already published papers, but the concept of uh, processing the nickel concentrate without any sulfur emission, that seemed like a very good idea, but uh, that, that's something we have at the university that uh, I personally look at it more as an educational way. So. Uh, when the patent is long or costly, we just proceed with publications, and as soon as you publish, it's not patentable anymore. So in these areas, exactly not. I know some companies uh, that we've worked with, they have a lot of patents on this, but not us personally in these areas. Next question. Don't be bashful. Engineers are not bashful. Question on the left. So the question is whether carbon tax would help this? Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, any, any one of these have to eventually be translated into an environmental benefit. And if there is a dollar uh, attached to it, that would help the industry to offset the processing costs. So like I, uh, like I said, the legislation, it's the main driver for processing of any waste. So, uh, in, in fact, the whole energy recovery thing, uh, it is now driven by carbon tax, uh, not by the dollar value of the heat. Another question from the same questioner. I guess I thought in terms of legislation, that's usually specifically legislating to reduce outputs of certain pollutants, whereas carbon tax is much more of a carbon, uh, sorry, much more of a market driven uh, tax where you can either do it or not, just, it just puts in place new incentives. Yes, once the carbon tax is there, which I believe it's to some part driven by legislation, then uh, in, th yes, they would have a big incentive to invest in these technologies. Like this heat recovery, it's, uh, it's huge again because of uh, carbon tax. Yeah. Next question. Don't be bashful. Last call, you don't have to be a metallurgical engineer or a mining engineer. <laughs> if not, please join me in thanking Professor Baruti. Uh, thank you very much. Okay.